In today's conversation, Brad and I will be discussing certain companies, their stocks, valuations, and performance for educational purposes. We believe this information is valuable for our listeners and viewers in light of current economic and market conditions we're experiencing in the summer of 2022. We do not consider this conversation to be investment advice. Please consult your financial professional before making any financial decisions. Around every corner, there seems to be a new headwind that these markets are having to face. And let's face it, you know, November last year was really the last time that we saw markets in, in fairly decent order. And since then, it's just been one headline risk after another. And here we are today, you know, S&P is roughly off around 20 percent and NASDAQ's off 30 plus percent. Yeah. And bonds are down 10 percent so it's just been a whirlwind across all the major asset classes over the last seven months starting your route to retirement welcome back to the guided retirement show it is season seven i'm dean barber your host and ceo and founder of barber financial group i want to thank all of our listeners and viewers for the uh, you know, massive amount of uh, support that you've given this program. It wouldn't be possible without you, our listeners and viewers. With that, I have a bit of housekeeping to begin our new season. We wanted to make it easy as ever for you to start planning for your retirement. By visiting the link in the show notes and clicking the Start Planning button, you can get access to the exact same financial planning tool we use for our clients. No cost, no obligations. So get out to the link in the show notes and click the Start Planning button and get started on your retirement plan plan today, all on your own and from the comfort of your own home. I also want to remind folks that we do a bi-weekly webinar series called the Barber Financial Group Educational Series. Every other Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central, we host a webinar focused on retirement planning topics. You can register at barberfinancialgroup.com slash events. Excited today to have back in action Brad Casper. He's the president of Life Strategies Analytics, a investment analytics firm. Brad was last with us in October of 2021, where we talked about assessing the risk in your portfolio at all-time market highs. Today, Brad and I will be tackling inflation, interest rates, bonds, stock markets. Where are we? Where are we headed? Please enjoy my conversation with Brad Casper. All right, Brad Casper of Life Strategies Analytics back here on the Guided Retirement Show. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you, Dean. Always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you know, so last time you were on the the uh, podcast here uh, was back in October of 2021, and you and I did a show in October of 2021 talking about assessing your risk in uh, all-time market highs. And the the markets continued on up for uh, another few weeks, but then all of a sudden uh, the uh, calendar turned to January first of twenty twenty two, and all hell broke loose. Yeah, it's it's been a wild year. I'd say I've probably aged five years in the last seven months alone since we've last done this podcast, and. It's because around every corner there seems to be a new headwind that these markets are having to face. And let's face it, you know, November last year was really the last time that we saw markets in, in fairly decent order. And since then, it's just been one headline risk after another. And here we are today, you know, S&P is roughly off around 20% and NASDAQ's off 30 plus percent yeah. and bonds are down 10%. So it's just been a whirlwind across all the major asset classes over the last seven months. And uh, I, I think the topic of October last year of assessing risk in, in highs is just as relevant as it might be today, assessing risk at some of these market lows and trying to work through it and what we do uh, to kind of face the situation that we're in. Right. And I think the biggest thing that people don't know um, is where's the bottom of this equity market. Um, but before we get to the equities, Brad, I want to I want to start out by talking about bonds. And um, I don't think anybody expected to see their bond fund or their bond ETF down 10, 11, 12% this year? Well, heck, you'd have to go back 50 years of market history to find a time frame where bonds drew down 10% or greater. And so I, I, I say that because a lot of times it's, it's not that we haven't witnessed bonds go through a cycle like this, but it hasn't been in the last 50 years. So, yeah, it's yeah. been a long time. Well, the last time uh, that we've seen anything remotely close to the overall economic situation that we find ourselves in today was the late 70s and early 80s. That's right. And you and I were talking about that before the podcast here. And the, the fact is that Anybody that was in the financial services industry in any meaningful capacity at that point in time has long since retired. And so we don't have a lot of people with a lot of experience 
of what we're dealing with. So we have to go back and we have to take history as a guide for how to deal with this because we have a stagnating economy. And as we're doing this show, it's the it's, it's July the 13th. Um, so by the time the podcast comes out, we're going to know what the second quarter GDP was and whether or not the economy is actually in a recession or not. But more and more uh, economists are saying, yeah, I think we are. What do you think? I, I think we are as well. And uh, we, we said as much about two months ago, but back up a little bit further. So at the beginning of 2022, uh, we always release what we call our, our kind of state of the markets, our 2022 market outlook. And in there, we, we address kind of four key headwinds. We were talking about the supply chain issues, which were still running hot, which also tail into the inflationary pressures, which has grown dramatically. Uh, we talked about uh, the concern that we had with the Fed's ability to kind of do this soft landing, which I think is a little bit obnoxious language. What does soft landing really mean? Um, we talked about- Because they're a good pilot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We talked about uh, slowing just economic uh, GD, or excuse me, just economic data, not specifically GDP, but data in general. And we've definitely seen a softening of, of economic data across the board. Um, and then the last one was a COVID uh, concern that we had, and it was really the zero tolerance policy out of China. And I know all of these seem, you know, slightly unrelated, but they all kind of feed on each other, right? Uh, because those those same headwinds that we addressed at the beginning of the year seem to have been on steroids since then and just kind of compiled upon each other. So what does that mean? Well, Fed came in, uh, inflation's running hot. Today's print came in at 9.1. It, it missed expectations. Uh, of being what 8.8, .8, I think is what they were looking for. So right. we came in a little bit hot, which is a, another year over year miss on wildly high inflation that we haven't seen since the early 1980s, as we discussed earlier. So the Fed's in a tough spot, right? They have to step in here and try to slow this overall economy. And they're doing so by raising the Fed funds rate, which quite frankly, we think got away from them at the tail end of 21. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, I think the writing was on the wall that inflation was heating up. They should have started raising rates last year. Um, so I, I think the important thing for people to understand, because we were on bonds there, is why are bonds doing what they're doing? Right, you you saw the ten-year Treasury start the year at around one and a half percent, and has been as high as three and a half percent this year. And as we're doing the show, it's just slightly under three percent, and we've got a pretty steeply inverted yield curve at this point in time, which generally points towards a recession. Um, and so, just really quickly, with bonds, if you own a individual bond. You know what you pay for the bond. You know That's what right. the value is going to be at maturity, and you know what the interest rate is. So you can calculate your yield to maturity if you hold it to maturity, and you know what that return is going to be. But in the meantime, most people that don't own individual bonds, they may own bond ETFs or they may own bond mutual funds. Well, you have to understand what the duration of that ETF or that fund is because – you look at the uh, bond ag as an example. I think the duration, uh, average duration is like six and a half or something like that. And so what that means is if you get a 1% rise in the 10-year treasury, you're going to lose 6.6% in the value of that uh, of that bond. Well, we got more than a 1% rise. We got a, so, so much of a rise that we were at one point, I think the bond ag was down 12 and a half percent this year. Right. So w when the Fed starts moving interest rates, right, they only control the short end side of the, right. the Fed funds rate, the, the short end of the curve. But what the rest of the curve will do, the 10s, the 20s, the 30s will start to adjust based off of the interest rate movements that the Fed is doing. So the fact that they started to expedite that movement, all of a sudden it put greater pricing pressure within the 10s, 20s, and 30s. I mean, look at 30-year mortgage rates now. I know, They're, almost 6%. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you've jumped over 2.5% since the beginning of the year. So all of a sudden that that home that you wanted to buy at uh, you know $500,000 home just became a whole lot more expensive if you're going to borrow in a 30 year loan. Right. Same thing with a 10 year bond, right? As, as these rates go up, it puts pricing pressure in, on them. Well, but here's, here's the question though, Brad. Here, here, I think that I want to go back to the Fed and to the overnight rate that you talked about. That's the short end of the curve, right? So what are the chances that the Fed gets to its three to three and a half percent overnight rate by the end of the year, which is what they're talking about, 
and we don't see more upward movement on the sevens, the tens, the twenties and thirties. Then you're just pushing us right into recession, right? I mean, you're going to invert the yield curve even more dramatically than it is today. And and maybe that's okay. Maybe we're already in recession and the Fed has a little bit of room to continue to drive us into it. But I, I'd be careful with some of that, right? First of all, the markets are trying to price in six to 12 months in advance at any point in time. And right now they're pricing in that you're going to have another 75 basis point movement in July and probably another potentially uh, 75 basis po- uh, jump in September. Now, if those play out, that's going to put us pretty darn close to that 3% target that they're looking at. So between now and then, what kind of action are we going to get on the 10 year treasury? Because if it continues to collapse, I'm going to argue that I think it backs them in a corner where the odds of the 75 basis point rate hikes in the next two meetings start to go down. And if you want to know my personal opinion on this, I think we have one more rate hike. And if we see a softening of inflation, I think they're going to cool their stance a bit. I don't think they're going to get out of the game of, of continuing to try to normalize, which, by the way, Powell was on a great path to normalization before COVID hit, right? And in fact, in 2018, we kind of hit the high of that normalization process. And what happened back then, we watched the twos and the tens get darn near close to inverting. And so the Fed stepped in and said, hey, we ran too far, too fast. We got too hot. And what they do, 2019, they were actually cutting rates going into 2020 when COVID hit and we went to zero interest rate policy. So I share that because there's a lesson that I think Powell probably learned during that time frame of there's a balancing act of, of, of not just killing the overall economy. But the difference between now and 2020 is a 9.1% inflationary print that we're dealing with today. That has to be the primary mandate of the Fed. That's right. And, and, and I, you know, so I guess my question to you is, what is your outlook for, let's just use the bond aggregate uh, as a whole between now and the end of the year. How do you think that uh, plays out? Because the yield's not great yet. I mean, quite honestly, I I can go buy a one-year treasury and I can get a better yield than buying a bond aggregate. Uh, Yeah. So um, I think the uh, Barclays U.S. bond ag ends the year better than where where we're at right now, right? I I mean, there is a benefit of that coupon clipping along. If we can just get some stability out of the 10-year, and I think you're starting to see it, right? We've been up to three and as high as three and a half. The last two times we've been up to 325 on a 10 year and it starts to hit this pretty strong resistance level and has a tendency to find its way back down. I don't think it's going to break above that 325 uh, until we get some clarity of how far this Fed is really looking to run. And right now, I, I think the bond markets are pricing in that the Fed has to stall at some point within the next couple of meetings. And that's because of the slowing of the economic slowing activity. Slowing of the but, economic activity. But, I, but again, I think you've got where I where I am concerned is that the inflationary numbers, the, the inflation, the pure inflation itself is harming you know, the vast majority of Americans far more than a bad bond market or bad stock market is harming the wealthy people. It's just it's it's causing them to not be able to do the things that they want to do. Uh, the discretionary spending, we've seen that decline substantially uh, over the course of the last several months. Uh, and so I think the Fed really has to be aggressive to kill inflation because I, as we know from the late 70s, early 80s, you can have runaway inflation with a stagnating economy for sure. a long period of time. Yeah. And there's a scenario where stagflation plays out, right? It's uh, it, it, the probabilities of it are still fairly low at this point, but they're, they're, they seem to be in, increasing every single month. So, but, but let's go back. You know, the, the Fed has a primary mandate. It's protect the value of the dollar and keep inflation in check. Uh, a third kind of loose mandate is making sure they keep unemployment in, in line to some degree. So, um, so two of those things they're doing a pretty good job at. Yeah, unemployment still looks really good, which is why I think you're going to get a lot of banter that goes back and forth. If we get a negative GDP print here in second quarter, which would be the textbook definition of a recession, right? Two ne- uh, consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. I think the narrative that's going to come out by a lot of uh, – economists and and market uh, specialists are going to be, yeah, this isn't a real recession. Well, you can't move the goalposts on the definition of what a recession is, right? (laughs) I I, I read something about that here last week where somebody's saying, well, you know, even if we have negative GDP, this isn't going to be a real recession because, you know, 
you know, people are still doing well. We got low unemployment and you can't have a recession with low unemployment. And it's like, well, you can still have negative GDP growth, sure. which is the definition of a recession. Well, and, and if you kind of go to their core thesis with all of this, it is uh, really this recession is not necessarily uh, an overheating of the economy. It's really the sheer amount of money that we've pumped into the system over the last decade, right? Uh, and, and to that point, I, I get it. And I think we addressed it on the last show. We said there's a scenario where... Uh, if you were to remove the backstop of the Federal Reserve and the amount, massive amounts of money that they've pumped into the buyback, uh, bond buyback programs back in 2020, uh, if you start to remove the uh, stimulus checks that everybody was getting during the pandemic, um, you know, where does this market go? And, and we're seeing it, right? When, right. when you uh, dry up some of that capital, all of a sudden, reality starts to set in. But, but this can't... You know, we were but looking at some but, of the P.E. ratios. It can't be more clear than that, right? Well, and, and, and again, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but during the pandemic and following the pandemic, it was almost like the United States was becoming China, thinking that the government was going to be able to <laughs> control the uh, statistics of the economy. And that simply can't work because, like it or not, consumer spending is still 70% of our gross domestic product. And between corporations and government spending, that's only 30, right? So the government, they can't spend enough money or do something to control the economy. Now, they were successful in, in, in bailing out uh, companies and industries back in 08. They were successful in you know stopping the bleeding in the bond market sure. and the stock market during COVID. Um, but when you've got inflation running as hot as it is, they can't just keep funneling money into this thing. Well, these have been like shots of morphine to the economy, right? But yeah. what's the problem with shooting morphine is eventually it's going to wear off. So the question is, did you fix the actual pain point that you had that you were using the morphine for in the first place? Well, so go back to 2008, right? That was the original TARP TALF, the original uh, bond buyback programs that were literally being written in midair to kind of bail us out of the financial crisis at that time. Right. And then in 2020, we, we dusted that playbook off and jacked that thing full of steroids and we just went at it. And what did it do? It, it, it did. I, I mean, I've never seen a recovery as quickly as we should have seen back in 2020. No. Think about that. I mean, I, I know it, it is insane. Well, compared to today, right? I, I get that this time feels different because we're now six months into kind of this drawdown period. And so there, there's some investor fatigue that's playing out in this. But the reality is the depth of the drawdown in 2020 was 35% on the S&P 500. We're roughly at 20 right now. There's another potential 15% to go to even get back to what we saw in 2020. So I, I use that as the example because in 2020, we, we, we shot ourselves up with that morphine. We had a, one of the fastest recoveries I've ever seen after a 35% drawdown in the S&P 500. And now we're, we're dealing with the aftermath of it because we need either more morphine or we need to allow th those wounds to heal, in my analogy. And, and right now, those wounds are pretty darn deep. And yeah, we're they learning are. they're deeper than we uh, a lot of people had thought going into it. And I think we addressed a lot of those concerns in that last uh, podcast series. Yeah, too. I, yeah, I know we did. I'm going to be facetious here for a minute, but what you know, what do you think if uh, Biden's three and a half trillion dollar stimulus package would have passed at the beginning of 21? Uh, I, I think it it would have crippled our economy. Um, I, I think the inflation would be worse now. Absolutely. Than uh, I, and in all fairness, I, I think. Uh, even under the Trump, uh, the, you know, the massive amount of stimulus packages then, uh, it, it, it's not necessarily a party thing. It's it's more of a, we have a spending problem. And unfortunately, we've become prone to leaning on it every time we find ourselves in trouble. But guess what? Backstop's gone. You know, if uh, look at the Fed's finally allowing the balance sheets to unwind during this time frame. These are all tools that should slowly start to help cool inflation. But what we don't know, Dean, is how long is it going to take? Right. Because I, I'd mentioned before this, the, the only cure to high prices is high prices. Eventually, things get so expensive that we're going to go there and say, I'm not buying that. It's not a need at this point. Yeah. All right. I, I'm focusing on what do I need, not what I want. And when that starts to play out, there's going to be a change in terms of uh, what used to be a supply deficit becomes a supply surplus. 
all of a sudden the cost of these uh, brick and mortars, like uh, you know, you're starting to see it, the, the Walmarts, the Targets, the Costco's, uh, cost of goods will start going on sale. There'll be bigger things where they have to empty off their shelves. These are all healthy signs that we're starting to see early stages of, but you know, as well as I do, it, it can take years to work through some of these things. And what I'm fearful of is if you look at the last 10 years, every time we've had a market sell-off or draw down in the marketplace in the last 10 years, it's been followed by a wildly rapid recovery. If we sit here and wait for that same pace recovery, I, I'm afraid we could be sitting here waiting for a, for a while. Well, but remember, and what we're talking about right now, why we had those rapid recoveries was because the stock market, it was addicted to the morphine that the Fed would provide, right? Sure. And they, they, were so, they would just go, oh, things look bad. Let's, let's, let's throw some money into this. And, and uh, they can't do it this time. Yeah. They can't. I mean, not if they want to go tackle what their primary mandate is. And that's why I go back to it. So I argue that when when you start doing the TARP and TALF back in like 08, and then you, you do it again in 2020, um, all of a sudden, it's like you've added an additional mandate of controlling or suppressing market volatility. That's not the mandate of the Fed. And they're going to learn this lesson the hard way. And my, my one of the things that I've, I've been harping on, because uh, Pal did uh, that um, 60 minute interview. What was it a year and a half ago? I, I can't remember when it was. And he was on there just wildly confident in the Fed's ability to control inflation and manage through whatever turbulent times happen to be around the corner. And, and I made the statement uh, to, to our group afterwards. I said, anytime there's that much conviction and your ability to control something that's so wildly out of your, your control, uh, you're going to have problematic times around the corner. And so well, that's no different though, uh, Brad than Ben Bernanke in 2007 saying that Fannie and Freddie were safe and that, <laughs> you know, the mortgage, there was no mortgage crisis. There's no, the, there's no loan crisis. And he, he, he was kind of, he, he, he spewed that stuff all the way up to the end of 2007. Yeah. And I don't even, make, I think it was even into, even in the mid 2008 before absolutely. everything fell apart uh, and Lehman brothers went bankrupt and absolutely. And what did we do there? We had to bail everybody out and yeah. pump money into the system. So, and I, I hope this doesn't come off. I'm not bad mouthing uh, Powell's job. I wouldn't want his job in a million years. I'm not bad mouthing what you know Bernanke was doing. These are very difficult things to kind of see and predict and project. But what I, I, I what I share with people is these are wildly bright people with the pulse on what's going on. And guess what? If they're getting it wrong, what else is wrong at this point? Right. And, and I think that's where the, you know, when we started this conversation of what are the headwinds that we're facing, because what markets really don't like is uncertainty. And until we start getting some clarity, but, but, but let's, let's take the other side of this conversation for a second, right? Let's say uh, if I were to add Russia, Ukraine to our list of, of headwinds at this point, well, what if Russia, Ukraine came to the table tomorrow? Right, and all of a sudden we we have a conflict that is ha, has an end in sight. Markets are going to react favorably to it. That's not going to happen. What if uh, inflation were to come in and it was eight point five today versus the nine nine point one that we saw? Markets are going to look at that and say, okay, it's cooling. That transitory statement it, it held true. It was just about two years late, right? So uh, we're one good news cycle, or you know, a little bit of clarity away from markets being able to settle in a little bit. And, and I think that's where when we started our conversation before we jumped on air here, it was looking at you know some of the the PE ratios of big stock names right yeah, now. Yeah, we got them right here. So let's yeah. As a reminder, in the next part of our conversation, Brad and I will be discussing certain companies, their stocks, valuations and performance for educational purposes. We believe this information is valuable for our listeners and viewers in light of current economic and market conditions we are experiencing in the summer of 2022. We do not consider this conversation to be investment advice. Please consult your financial professional before making any financial decisions. Let's do this. And here, here's the thing. Okay, so you take a take a stock and, and let's just use uh, Tesla as an example, okay? <laughs> so Tesla stock is down 50% this year. Right. So the question then is, OK, well, does that make Tesla a buy? Is, is that a good you know, is that a good thing? Well, Tesla's price to earnings ratio is still at ninety six point nine as of the date that we are, are producing this. Um, Amazon off 50 percent this year. They're uh, uh, they're at fifty three point six on their price to earnings ratio. So I would say that Tesla, based on what they do and how they do it and how rapidly they're going to be able to make vehicles, et cetera, they're, they're probably at least. 
fifty percent overvalued at this point. So to get them back to fair value, even a PE of fifty for a company like Tesla still could be a little bit rich. A, 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 a PE of fifty three point six for a company like Amazon still too rich. Sure. So that means that there's room on the downside for these things to go farther before you really, because you know, if you go back to uh, two thousand and eight, and even more importantly, back to two thousand, two thousand one, and two thousand and two. Um, we've put out a chart many times that shows uh, fair value uh, and then where the markets are. And most of the time, the markets uh, are, are above fair value. They, they spend way more time above fair value than they do below yep. fair value. Yep. But when you get into a, a, a negative market cycle, you'll typically see not just a reversion to the mean, but but below the mean, right? So So you could get those market valuations to go below fair value, you get you get into the market valuations where they're below fair value. Now you're saying, okay, yeah. Now now it's time to go shopping. Time is now it's time to start buying. But I think it, you have to have caution between now and that time. Yeah, and, and you know the question I get all the time is, is the bottom already priced in? Well, who knows, right? I mean, the the reality is, as you just stated, is there's a lot further that some of these names could go to get. And they back make to up a, more, a huge part of the S and P five hundred. Yeah, they make up a huge part of the Nasdaq. And, and I think that's what's so dangerous. Right, you know, right now the S and P five hundred, uh, it's about twenty six percent of it's represented by big tech names, right? Right. And so the, these indexes have been skewed. If you were to go back into 2001 and look at who were the top 10% or top 10 holdings in the SP 500 in 2001 versus today, it's very different. It was very much value oriented names back in 2001 and uh, 2021, it's all tech names. So there's been a massive rotation and there could be a natural shift that's taking place here. But at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not here to debate if, um, you know, we go down another 10, 15, 20%. We, very easily could. We could have already priced in a bottom. But what I will debate is when you start to get to these levels, going through the exercise of knowing who's cheap, who's expensive, the ability to separate good names and bad names through these types of market cycles help control risk within portfolios. And not only that, but when you start to see interest rates rise, you know the the, ac uh, the accessibility to uh, cheap capital becomes more expensive, right? So who has the deep balance sheets? Who has the cash on hand? And so I use this as an example, like take Microsoft. Microsoft's been printing silly money for the last 10 years. Yeah. And what are they doing with it? They're buying back their stock. And so they're doing a lot of things that are very prudent. Or look at Google, who's had a massive sell-off in 22. And, and you look at a company like that that's so flush with cash. And so people that are saying, uh, I get that this is painful. Where's a good so uh, spot to start stepping back in? Because these are still really good, uh, what we think would be uh, longer term ideas uh, to be exploring. Yeah. So you look at, let's let's do a few more of these because I think this is really important for people to, to understand. So Microsoft is, I think, as close to fairly valued as you're going to get at 26.4 because there's, I mean, as big as they are, there's still a lot of room for growth and they, you know, they repeat customers sure. more and more, right? Uh, Apple uh, valued at twenty three point seven. You know both of those stocks are off, but those two at because of the types of companies that I think they're probably pretty fairly valued. Um, uh, Google twenty point seven six on the price to earnings ratio. Again, they're printing money. Yeah. Uh, so some of those names um, have gotten down to a point where they they could be an attractive uh, buy right now. Uh, one of the interesting things is is you look at some of the value companies like a Procter and Gamble as an example with a higher price to earnings ratio than Apple. <laughs> yeah, it, it, what a wild example. Right? And that doesn't make any sense. It does not. And that's where I think you know, it, typically when you go through these types of market movements, uh, one of the quickest things that a lot of investors think about is let's just go find something that's paying a solid dividend or high income. And that's not always the solution, right? Uh, at, at this point, value, which large cap value is is typically the space that investors will go to. Um, you know, they're down about 12% on the year versus the 20 of the S&P and the 30 of the, of the NASDAQ. And you're sitting here going, well, why haven't they priced in more? Are they really that much uh, of a better deal? And to your point, uh, you know, uh, Procter and Gamble is the example. They may not have been fully tested through this cycle yet, which may, right. may mean that there's greater draw, uh, downside on uh, the value side. So those that are chasing income, I'm hoping hope you're not getting penalized. So th there's just greater research that it really comes back to. To yeah, I was just looking at I was just, you know the growth side of things. Just looking at the uh, growth fund of America, and it's off thirty percent this 30%. year. Thirty percent, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, a lot of these names are just getting pummeled. And think about it, though. If you look under the hood of some of those those uh, funds, um, again, those COVID, uh, the pandemic darlings, the Zooms, the Pelotons, they're down 50, 60, 70 percent. And, so and they you, should be. They should be. They, they got run up. They got bit up. They had a 10x movement in a period of time that was... Uh, typically takes a company uh, like theirs, you know, 20, 30 years to experience. Right. I mean, I, mean look heck, at, I, would, I would love for somebody to come in and value my company at a hundred yeah. times earnings. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? I, I mean, uh, the, the global shutdown was one of the wildest things that I have seen in terms of how resilient the tech space became and, and, and the way that we priced it out. There was a ton of money to be made, but it, it, at this point, a lot of it is just going right back to the way. Yeah, so. what happened with those names reminds me an awful lot of what happened with the dot-com bubble, where you had these companies and it's just like, well, this is the future. This is where it's all going to be. And so the money just goes piling in. And uh, But there's a lot of people, Brad, that didn't catch the upswing there. They were late. They, they, they didn't rotate. The average investor out there didn't rotate or go back into those growth names until probably mid-2021 when it was over. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, which brings up a great concept. And I, I think you'll like this. Like When we think about investing, uh, and if you're building a model, you, you, there was an old concept of uh, with the target date funds, right? That, right. Are you investing to or through the target date? And it was a concept of when are you really getting conservative? Are you getting conservative the closer you get to it or once you get through that date? And I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about that concept, and uh, especially as it in, in involves investing and in, in building models. When you build a model, do you, do you build a model uh, to an event, to a market event, or for through a market event? And uh, what, what I try to talk about is if we understand the risk of a portfolio or of certain different asset classes and behavior of those asset classes, we want to know that we've tested them through market cycles so that when we get to it, we don't find ourselves in this situation where we have to kind of jump ship or make massive changes. And uh, not that it's not relevant or necessary to do from time to time, but uh, you know, really building a, a strategy that to manage through events makes a, a lot of sense. And especially when it comes to understanding the risk of those portfolios. I, I like I like your concept of discussing the target date funds because I think that makes a lot of sense. I just pulled up one of the target date 2030 funds <laughs> and and guess what they're down year to date. 20%. 20%, yeah, probably yeah, right, everything right, right the S&P 500, yeah. Yeah, right along with the S&P yeah. 500. So even though you've got something there that you're saying, "Hey, I'm going to retire in the next 7 or 8 years, I need to start getting a little bit more conservative." It just the target date funds they don't in my opinion, I don't think I don't like them because I don't have enough control. I, I can't. I can't say no. I want to reduce my equity exposure. I want to. I want to take my fixed income exposure all down to you know ultra short durations, and right. I, I don't want that. I, I need to be able to. Tr I, I need to be able to have control there. Um, and you can't have that control in the target date funds. And so that's one of the crazy things. I think you th look at people in their four hundred one k plans, and generally, generally speaking they're going to have either the S&P 500 or they're going to have one of those target date funds is what they're going to own. Yeah. And if they have a bond in there because they're getting conservative, it's going to be a Barclays US bond ag-esque type right. of position, which right. by the way, it didn't help you. Right. right. And, and this is where it's, I think the big rub is in 22. If it, it, cause we're, we're now in second quarter, right. And uh, second quarter is completed. We, we now have two consecutive quarters where bonds have been uh, wildly disappointing from a portfolio perspective. And why is this relevant? Well, if, if I'm going to build a diversified asset, uh, diversified model, which is ways that we have utilized for decades to try to control risk within strategies. And then all of a sudden, there, there's always been pockets, Dean, where uh, you know correlations go to one across asset classes. It's very rarely that we see long-term sustained correlations of one between bonds and equities. But in the last six months, I've, I've read more articles and seen more pieces around the death of 6040. And everybody's talking about uh, bonds are no longer relevant because they're highly correlated to equities, or at least that's what it felt like. We went through six weeks of markets uh, in 22, where S&P 500 was down less than the bonds. So when I look under the hood of yeah. who's my risk control within a portfolio, and they're bleeding more than my equity counterparts, man, it feels like we're in uh, a upside down world at that point. But here's what I will state is bonds have not had a healthy reset in how long? 
uh, I mean, 40 years, 40 years. Okay. This may be one of the healthiest resets for bonds because right now, but there's going to be, there's got to be more pain to come before. I mean, even it, you, you still look across the board. If you go out and try to buy corporates, individual corporates today, um, you're still playing a premium. They're not even, they're not even at par yet. Yeah. It, it, I mean, there's got to be a point where some of those come to a discount. Once they do, uh, I, I think you find kind of this rush and flood back into the conviction of bonds. And, and hopefully it'll be at a point where the income's higher, right? We, we've been complaining about the ag. Why invest in it? I mean, a, you, you can go get a higher paying dividend equity uh, name in the value side versus my my bond that's paying, you know, sub 2% as right, it was a year ago. But you've got to be again. careful of the valuations on those equities too. But those valuations like- are wildly expensive. So did we reprice the bond markets to a degree where they could be favorable. And I, I'm not here to predict either way. I mean, so uh, let, let, well, let's, let's go to some different types of bonds though, uh, Brad, because you know, bonds aren't all created equal. That's right. And um, you know, you've got the STIP, which is the short term inflation protected treasuries. Um, got a nice yield on it right now, a little over five and a half percent. Right. Um, it's also down 4% this year. Right. Okay. But that's better than the 10 and a half percent that the bond ag is down. Um, and that, that I think you'll wind up with, with inflation continuing to run hot. Um, you, sh- you, you have a good chance that you could wind up with a slightly positive return in that type of an investment. So when we look into the hood of the models that, w- that we, we have built out, you know, there's a lot of fixed income positions. All of them have actually done better on a relative basis to the S&P 500 or excuse me, the to ag. the Barclays U.S. Bond Ag. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they're not still negative. <laughs> exactly. right? and, and, and so I, I don't say that in a, a bragging way, if anything. Uh, there is nothing that is worse feeling than when your bonds are negative within your portfolio, uh, because that's the component that people have come to learn and know to be the more conservative thing. So I, I think you're hitting the right talking points, right? There, there, there's places within the fixed income space when volatility is running high in bonds, shorten up your durations, improve your qualities. Um, if uh, look outside of just kind of corporates, right there, there's uh, credit vehicles. I'm not suggesting high yields are a great buy at this point, but um, high yields, you have bank loans. There's other tools that you can utilize. And we've taken advantage of a number of those to improve our relative outperformance. But uh, it, it, by no stretch of the imagination is it you know completely offsetting what we're seeing on the equity side of things, and that's what we really need. But I think there's also some good some good values out there right now in legacy mortgage backed securities. That, MBS looks good. Yeah. AMBS looks good. There there is. Um, I, I will tell you the point the, is the point is there's opportunities in the bond market today. Finally, yeah, the, there, finally. There, there is some opportunities, but it's not just in the. It's, and you don't. The thing is, where most people's money is is in their four hundred one k plans. They don't have these options yeah. with inside their four hundred one k plans because the the you know, the plan provider saying, well, that's, you know, those are too esoteric. Those don't, you know, nobody's going to understand those. Nobody knows what they are. Or, or they'll use a net long-term conversation that, oh, this will be just as good net long-term. Well, and, and look, think about this, the 60, 40, the ag, I mean, it's done well almost since the inception of 401k plans because 401k plans didn't come into existence until the late 70s. Yep. And so, you know, for you look at the last 40 years, bonds have been great. The bond ag has been great. You, you've you had maybe one or two slightly yeah. negative years, but I mean, it's been, they've, there are many years, let's go to 2000, 2001, and 2002. We roll into that dot com bubble with nice five and a half, six percent interest rates. And the dot com bubble burst. In comes the zero interest rate policy. In comes the you know recession. Interest rates start dropping. Bonds are making 16 percent a year. That's offsetting the losses in your equities. Yeah, but it's not going to happen this time because of inflation. Well, well, so that's the million dollar question, though, right? If we get into any type of sustainable recessionary environment, where's the risk off trade going to go? It's going to go to bonds. It's going to go to bonds. And so do we find ourselves in a scenario where we all of a sudden see a 3% tenure go back down to uh, what, one and a half, two percent if we got into recession? And, and I'm not suggesting that's the case. I'm just saying if we got into a real risk off event, we're still the best, uh, the, the, the U.S. Treasury is still the best safe haven for assets to flow to. Yeah. And I don't think that this round would be any different if real pressure was being uh, realized, not just domestically, but on the global stage as well. So 
it's hard. I, I think there's a relevant place for bonds within portfolios. And the only thing that I can tell anybody is when I get a question like, should we be sitting in bonds or what do we do at these lows? I go back and I look at as much data as possible. And, you know, I can take the ag all the way back into the early 70s, right? And so you, you have almost 60 years of history. And all I can tell you is the last time we saw a market drawdown on on bonds, uh, both uh, any of them, if you look at intermediate govies, intermediate munis, uh, intermediate uh, corporates, You'd have to go back into 1978 to find a period that bonds drew down 12%. And the only one that drew down greater was the municipals. Right. But th- th- that was a, a a massive supply issue and balance sheet issue that was going on uh, state levels back in, in, in uh, the late 70s, all because of inflation. Um, so – since then, we've had a number of drawdowns, and typically those drawdowns cap around that 5 to 10% when you get into real serious market environments. So if that's all I know of what the ag has been able to tell me for 60 plus years, you know, when somebody asks me, uh, you know, are we going down another 20% on the ag, I'd say there's probably a greater probability that we've priced in a lot of the drawdown than not. Now, again, doesn't mean that we couldn't see 15, doesn't mean we couldn't see 20% drawdown. If something happens and that 10 year starts moving, we could see it. But the probability of that happening uh, based off of what we know of six years of history is is pretty minimal at this point. It's lower than the odds of them of bond settling in and doing better going I forward. I think the biggest difference at this, the way that I see it right now, Brad, is we we We've never been at a time in history where we sat at virtually a zero interest rate policy for 14 years. Sure. Right. You know, and, and you're, you're coming off of, you know, low ones, uh, you know, low to mid 1% uh, on the 10 year treasury. Well, in order for us to say, okay, well, everything's going to be fine. We got to expect that these 10, this 10 year is going to start to drop in yield, but how can we have a 10 year dropping in yield when the fed fund wants to be at three to three and a half percent? Well, it's going to take a lot of stones for the Fed to raise rates if there is a significant enough event that is causing people to kind of go to the risk off posturing. Right. But eventually, it, eventually, though, we've got to get back to a more normal monetary policy, I don't more disagree. normal interest rate environment. I, I've preached that since 2009. Uh, I mean, but even what, that great experiment is, is still has an unwound. But, but there's there, there, what my, the reason I say it is because I don't think the pain's done. I, I think that, you know... You, you, if we're going to get to a more normal interest rate environment, which is really what we need to do, there's going to be more pain in the bond ag. Uh, very well could be. So, but, but what I try to think about, Dean, is there's a premium that's paid to carry risk assets, right? And like it or not, bonds are a risk asset. Equities are a risk asset. The premium is the drawdown, the pain uh, that you experience during these types of market cycles. Right. And, and, and so our job is not necessarily to um, project where it's going. It, it, it's to sit here and say, do we still have good players that are going to help us wade through this next round of whatever it looks like? And what what keeps popping up on our screens and talking points is more along the lines of, there could be more to go, but there's a higher probability that a lot of the down has probably been priced in. Now, that said, remember, I, I, I used the S&P 500 as my example earlier. We're down 20. They were down. It was down 35 percent in t- uh, 2020. Right. So we still have we, we haven't even touched the lows of what we did in 20. Uh, go back into 2008, 2009, drew down 47 percent in a two year time frame. We, we're not even close to that. And so the, the, the conversation is. The same exercise you should do with your valuations on stock names needs to be done on your bond names as well. Right. And say, uh, you know, can I still hold this? Can I stomach if this thing goes down 40% on the S&P? Can I stomach my equities? If the ad goes down to 20%, can I stomach that within my bonds? And if not, we've, we've got to be a little bit more dynamic as we have tried to do with some of the models. And as you know, with uh, we're not purely in a Barclays U.S. bond ag type no, of position no, no. and equities. We, we have a little bit of everything, but w- we've been hit by some of the growth and tech movement as well, right? You know, you know what's interesting is, because now I think we can wrap up here by talking about what allocation should a person have today. And I just want to give an example of a meeting that I had with one of our certified financial planners and, and a couple of our clients this last week. So in the financial planning tools that we use, we're able to look at what's the total value of your assets, what's the total income need, what's Social Security going to be, what's your taxes. We look at everything, right? Build the plan out. And then we can go from 
100% cash to 10% bonds, 90%, or I'm sorry, 10% stocks, 90% bonds, all the way up to where you get to 100% stocks, right? Sure. And so in, in this couple's particular plan that we looked at, their probability of achieving their overall retirement objectives was a 95% probability of success with a 2080 portfolio, 20% equities, 80% fixed income. And by the time they got to a 70% equity and 30% fixed income, the probability of success had dropped down to 93 and it continued to drop the more equity exposure we got. So if, if you don't know what actual allocation gives you the highest probability of being able to achieve your financial objectives. Then you sit back and you listen to a conversation like you and I just had, and they're like, well, I don't know what to do now. And really you can, you can know exactly what to do, but you've got to have the proper financial plan and be working with a competent CFP to do it. But I'm glad you brought it all full circle here, right? I mean, the purpose of any model portfolio that you build or strategy that you're looking at is try to accommodate the goals of what you're trying to achieve within a, a financial plan. Without it, I think you're just aimlessly, you know, investing, right? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. It, it's, and that's why we tell people all the time, you know, don't call us or come see us if all you want to do is talk about asset allocation, because I'm not going to talk about asset allocation until I've done a full blown financial plan. And I know what your money needs to do. Once I know what your money needs to do, then we can start having a discussion around asset allocation and what's proper and what's best. And we can show you in black and white, what's the real numbers and what do you need to be doing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it brings relevancy to the conversation that we had earlier, right? Yeah. Who cares what the PE is on Tesla? If that has no bearing on the success of your Correct. ability to find, Correct. Uh, you know, success in your, your financial plan. You don't need to have the conversation. Um, but I, I think the bonds are a relevant conversation because, uh, you know, as you just said, it's, it's going to be a part of uh, probably long-term asset allocation planning uh, in, in anywhere you're going. And, and what uh, I w think is wildly entertaining is you mentioned this earlier, a lot of people that are running projections looking at inflation that are using, you know, low inflationary targets they that have in the past, yeah. Wildly problematic, right? It's very problematic because it's because you know I, I've seen multiple times where people will come into our office and they've already had a financial plan done by another advisor, and we log into their online access and we look at and they they the the financial planner was assuming a two percent inflation rate. I'm like, that's not going to work. Well, let's, let's put four percent in there, see what happens. The whole plan crashes. Sure, yeah, four percent. And think about that. We're at you know nine point one, and, and I'm. <laughs> Not saying we have to go project that out because there's there's greater odds that that's going to cool, right? Exactly I mean, right. And, and and to do that, you go back and you use the financial planning tools. You can do the historical tests and things right. like that. There's there's ways to to measure that and see exactly what that uh, yeah. was. But yeah, it, it, it all does come back to what's important to the person. How are they going to be able to accomplish their objectives? And, and then you can get into this discussion and, and leave this complicated stuff that you and I are talking about today to the professionals. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just going to get more and more complicated over the next couple of quarters as we try to digest all of this. But, you know, the, the reality is I, I was talking to an old uh, college professor that's become a friend of mine over the years. And I, he was showing me his financial plan and he go, I go, what's your benchmark that you're using here? He goes, it's just uh, CPI. I, I use inflation as my benchmark. And so he goes, I've been outperforming it uh, for years until the last year, <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, inflation has been darn near sub 2% for right. a decade and now it's up at 9%. And so he's felt like a, uh, and I said, why do you do that? And uh, the reality is he goes, I just need my money to be able to outpace. Right. And so as time goes on, that inflationary um, number, you need your money to be able to outpace inflationary uh, inflation over time. And I said, wow, that's wildly simplest, uh, simplistic way of thinking about it. But, but it's uh, really quite but powerful. I, yeah. You know, but we do the same thing in the financial planning tool. So what we look for is a real return, right? So right. we have, you have that you have the return on the investment minus inflation, that's your real return. Then what's your withdrawal requirements? Right. And, and, and can we maintain a positive number after we subtract the inflation and the withdrawal amount from your portfolio value? And right now it's, it's, it's super difficult, uh, in the, you know, where we're at today. Yeah. But think about 2008, like I, I remember a time in, in late 2008 where, uh, all of a sudden, your three years, your five year numbers on a lot of these investments were just annihilated after yeah. that movement. And I sat there and I go, man, I, I can't even uh, imagine 
a a cycle that gets us back to you know eight nine percent averages on some of these five and ten years. Um, and here's the positive thing is it did, it happened, right? Yeah. It, it's just a matter of time. And we've, we've got to make sure that we, we, we are calm, cool, collected through these types of market movements, understand the risks that are associated with the underlying posturing that you're using from a model perspective. And most importantly, make sure it aligns with what your financial plan is, is asking you to achieve. Right. If you line up all three of those things, I, I'd say your probabilities, um, improve dramatically. And as you can't tell i do a lot with probabilities and uh, <laughs> outcomes so uh i i think that's this still the best way to handle things i agree with you brad casper uh thank you so much for taking the time this to join fun. me here on the guided retirement show i uh, hope everybody enjoyed our discussion i want to end with one thing through a link in the show notes you can find access to the very same software that we use for our clients you can access it at no cost or obligation start building out that plan and we can give you a great understanding uh, if you choose to talk with one of our certified financial planners of what your asset allocation really should be, uh, not only at the time that we're recording this in, in uh, July of 2022, but at any point in your life, you really need to understand that. Thanks again for joining us here on the Guided Retirement Show. Starting your route to retirement. Thanks for watching. You can subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to leave a comment and share this with your friends.